All right, before we get started, let's start with a few housekeeping items. Um, if you're new to these webinar series with Plan Mecca, uh, we're using Zoom and there is a Q&A section um, located at the bottom of your screen. You can certainly um, type a question. I'll attempt to look at the Q&A section as we go along. Otherwise, I'll reserve that to the end. Um, at the conclusion of the CE, I'll go through the questions and make sure we don't have any outstanding questions that did not get answered. Uh, the chat section, we've already gotten familiar with that. Um, and we will see that you um, have the ability there to, to chat with me. I will use that maybe as we go along. I might ask some questions, make this a little interactive if we can and we can go ahead and chat um, and use that. Um, and then as far as CEs um, being provided, there is going to be one CE provided. It will be at the conclusion of this lecture, so stay tuned for the very end. I'll provide that um, at the very end. And as far as disclosure, I am an employee of Plan Mecca, um, and I'll be giving this presentation this evening. It is for CE, and it certainly is not about um, our particular products. This is all education related. And then as far as education, we have future webinars. You can find them at our website, which is planmecca.com. That's P-L-A-N or M-E-C-A. And if you go to planmecca.com, you can see just a few things that we have going on. Um, we have actually July 5th, this Friday at five o'clock central time, um, we have a hygienist, uh, Diane Miller, which will be talking about protect, uh, protective scaling techniques and ergonomics for career longevity. And then we will have next Wednesday, July 22nd at 6 p.m. Central Time, Tooth Preparation for Conservative CAD CAM Restorations from Dr. Stephen Gold. Um, and then the following Friday, July 31st at 12 o'clock Central Time, Perry Implantologist, top three major issues from a professional and at home maintenance standpoint from Dr. Uh, Chevron Healy. And then rounding out uh, August 7th on Friday at 6 p.m., Smart Scaling Techniques with our hygienist, Joy Void Holmes. So please join us, and that's at planmecca.com that you can sign up for the future webinars as well as see any webinars that we've had in the past. So my name is Brent Garvin. I am the Senior Product Manager with Plan Mecca. Um, just a little bit of background with, about me if you haven't seen any of my series for an hour with the expert that we're gonna talk about panoramic techniques and common errors tonight. Um, I'm the Senior Product Manager for Imaging uh, for Plan Mecca USA. I'm an associate member of the AOMR as well as the associate uh, of the American Association of Dental Maxillofacial Radiology. Um, uh, technicians, and then also a member of the International Association of um, Dental Maxifacial uh, Radiology as well. So um, hopefully I can share with you some of my uh, experience and expertise in the area of panoramic imaging for those that um, have panoramics and are looking for ways to correct things and give you the best tips and tricks uh, that I can for you. Uh, speaking of what we're going to accomplish today, we are going to gain a basic understanding of how panoramic imaging is developed and how it's influenced by the tube movement. Um, we're going to identify the categories of panoramic errors, which are preparation errors, there's positioning errors, and of course patient errors. And we'll correctly identify those common errors, and then you'll successfully be able to uh, correct, reduce, and hopefully eliminate many future panoramic errors uh, by taking this course. And the last thing, we are going to obtain a comprehensive step-by-step -step method to achieve repeatable diagnostic panoramic images. So before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to those that contributed to this presentation. Of course, my customers out there that have shared not only good images, but maybe some poor images that they received from other offices that we've uh, uh, incorporated into this presentation of the several panoramic errors there are in this industry. So some of them may look familiar to you. Uh, Jim Pinkowski, uh, formerly of uh, Plan Mecca, um, a mentor of mine who's taught me most of my uh, information and knowledge about panoramic imaging, along with my mentor and sponsor for the AOMR, um, Dr. Bob Langley, if you're not familiar with him, from the University of Texas, uh, one of the original board certified radiologists in the industry and taught me almost everything I know. So very thankful for all of that knowledge. And then I just want to acknowledge Dr. Um, Thacker in Ohio State University, some of the 
Um, the illustrations that I have in the presentation um, were shared by them. And so I just wanna uh, say thank you to them. And I am from Michigan. Um, so it is very tough for me to say those three words, the Ohio State, but I just did it. I got through it and we're gonna be okay tonight. So um, let's get moving and get talking about panoramic imaging. So when it comes to panoramics, obviously, um, inconsistent images is is what is seen in our industry and that's probably why you're here today is to learn a little bit more uh, maybe you're an assistant and you want to improve your techniques or a hygienist or a, a doctor looking at pans and you want to understand what might be going wrong so you know how to correct it uh, when you see a, a pan like that and of course as clinicians you all probably want the same thing consistent images whether you're a medical doctor or a dentist, it doesn't matter. Image consistency is what we strive for. Um, so you, we wanna be able to look at an X-ray, be able to diagnose quickly, and um, of course, move on um, to, the, to our next patient. So time is of the essence to be able to go through these scans. Uh, when it comes to time, if you ask a board certified radiologist how much time you should spend on a pan, they hope you will say several minutes as you go through that panoramic. We're certainly not gonna go over the technique of reading pans tonight. Those are held on our other lecture series, um, but this one will help identify some of the errors that you're going to see. And a lot of those errors take place because the staff are dealing with targeting lights. So as you can see on the screen, there are three targeting lights that are typically used in panoramic imaging. And unfortunately, that's what can lead to the issues with panoramic imaging. So if you're not familiar with how that tech technology is actually working, um, what's happening is, is when we take a panoramic, um, of course, we're looking at the patient and the machine obviously uh, passes radiation through the patient and takes an image of the patient and kind of spreads it out, which is, um, which is, um, uh, an, an issue. Are, are we having any technical issues with can't seeing my screen here? We have a question. Um, are we supposed to see something regarding positioning lights? Don't see them. Um, let's back up here. Does anyone see that screen? We all, all we see is you. Okay. All right. We got some no's here. So we got some technical issues. Let's go ahead and back up. You guys were just watching me, which probably wasn't too much fun. Let's back up here and make sure that the screen was sharing. So let's try that again. Boy, do we see it now? Let me maximize this. All right, let's give this another shot. I appreciate all the feedback. All right, yes, 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 yes. All right, let's scroll down here and make sure we're good. All right, so now we can see it. One more yes. All right, perfect, perfect. Thanks for letting me know. That was probably not the most fun uh, start for a webinar is not being able to see the screen. So let's go ahead and get this started again. So um, what I was showing here is the targeting light. So if I got a yes there, it looks good. We're all set. Um, is what the staff are used to when it comes to um, looking at their pans and positioning. So when it comes to taking a pan, obviously we're taking an x-ray of the patient. So the uh, x-ray uh, radiation is passing through the patient. And then I like to think of it as almost like it's peeling back and stretching out that image and that's how a panoramic is born. Um, and so it creates what's called a focal trough. And many ask, what's a focal trough, right? A camera has a focal point. So there's an area in which it's in focus. Um, a panoramic takes a focal trough. Think of it as a mouth guard. Um, so you can see that illustration on the um, left side of your screen. Looks more like a mouth guard. And so the, the purpose of the focal trough is to center that focal trough over the teeth or the jaw. So everything is in the area of what's called sharpness of an image. Anything that falls outside the area falls in the area of unsharpness. So that's how panoramics are, are developed and, um, and, and what a focal trough is all about. So when it comes to panoramic imaging, you'll probably see in your office, you have several different styles of panoramics. So there's popular uh, mirror style uh, uh, machines like this, where the operator's looking over the patient's shoulder, uh, the patient's looking into a mirror, 
the operators looking over their shoulder into that mirror to position the patient. What you see up here is more of a face-to-face -face positioning type of a machine. So maybe your machine looks like this where you're looking directly at the patient. And in the bottom right-hand corner, this is what's called face-to-face -face positioning or side entry types of machines. And this is really nice because now you have a full access to the patient, easy to get into the machine and um, position the patient as well. So when it comes to those targeting lights, what's happening is, is there's three position points, mid-sagittal, which is going right down the middle of the patient here. You have your Frankfurt plane and your layer light. All of those have a value and a purpose to the machines because it, when it comes to images, as we discussed earlier, most struggle with inconsistent images, whether we have large oversized anteriors, small uh, miniature teeth. Um, a lot of times you see images all over the place and it's because of those targeting lights that can be an issue. So what are manufacturers doing to um, address that sort of issue? Well, there's several different things that the manufacturers have come up with. So this particular uh, company has created what they claim to be a V-shaped type of beam. So remember I talked about that focal trough being like a U-shaped um, 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 sort of um, shape. We have a V-shaped um, sort of beam that is narrower at the, um, um, on the uppers and then wider on the mandible. Obviously this sort of V-shaped collimation is attempting to create more penetration power, as you can see here. So they want to create more radiation going through the mandible to get through the, the, the larger, uh, denser bone of the mandible. And then they thin out the upper because the maxilla doesn't need as much radiation uh, to penetrate. So that's what uh, some manufacturers are doing, is they're changing the actual shape of that focal trough, if that makes sense. And then as far as um, multi-layering is another technique. If you have a 3D machine, um, you might be familiar with this style of technique. Some machines that are 2D do multi-layering. Um, machines that have 3D capabilities that are also taken two-dimensional panoramics have similar capabilities. And so this is basically illustrating the different layering techniques. So think about that pan traveling around. And rather than taking one constant pulse, and taking one constant image to create one focal trough, it's creating multiple layers of that focal trough. So this uh, manufacturer is kind of touting uh, the differences between the amount of layers that they provide. So this manufacturer here, it looks like, has five layers. Some may have seven, some may have 10, and this company is um, claiming that they have 20 layers of that focal trough to develop a sharper, crisper image. Um, in fact, um, some of the manufacturers have different ways to gather that information. So let's say they're acquiring those 20 um, uh, images. What they then do is use, using the algorithms of the software, they then pull the different areas and regions of the image that they feel are in focus to develop that layering technique. So this is kind of illustrating what one of the manufacturers claims is uh, a way for them to gather those, uh, those types of images. And then the last one that I've seen out on the market uh, comes from a company that has incorporated uh, autofocus technology. This is very similar to maybe your iPhones, your um, Samsung phones, maybe a, a SLR camera, DSLR camera. The old days used to focus the cameras, those days are gone, right? So these photographers that are taking uh, multiple images, they're watching a football game and those cameras are, are, are taking multiple uh, photos in seconds, they're using autofocus. So these companies, what they do is they're attempting to find where the root tips are of, of the anteriors. What that allows it to do is to set the focal trough at the precise spot that it should be. Uh, what I mean by that is, is um, most of the targeting lights that we talked about, if we were to put that light between the lateral and the canine or right on the canine, we get inconsistent images from that because we don't know how those tooth, 
or those teeth are uh, positioned in the anteriors. So this company has the ability to automatically find those root tips. In fact, you'll see here a little illustration of uh, autofocus in action where it actually finds the root tips of the centrals and then sets the focal trough to get consistent repeatable images. So let's go ahead and move on to those panoramic errors that you may come across in your office. As I mentioned earlier, there's different types of panoramic errors. There's preparation styles, there are positioning, and then there's patience. So let's break those down and go through those independently. So when it comes to preparation errors, those types of errors are very common because we don't prepare the patient properly. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've seen images like this, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So obviously, upper left, pretty simple, uh, eyeglasses were left on. Um, so if we wanna have a good pan, remember we wanna remove objects um, from basically the necklace up to the eyeglasses, low hanging earrings uh, need to be removed um, because those can affect the image. Now, as you can see, the eyeglasses stayed up here because the image, um, uh, object is higher in the uh, panoramic image, so it tends to stay up there. It's objects that are lower that want to project higher. As you can see here on the upper right, uh, obviously either a necklace or maybe I would guess that is the hygiene bib that was left on because it looks kind of like little BBs there. But I've noticed in the bottom left-hand corner, if I was to zoom in on that area, I think I can here with, with my mouse here, um, and I highlight that, it almost looks like rings. So I'm probably gonna say that that was um, done by uh, wearing actually a uh, chain necklace that was left on during the panoramic exposure. Uh, bottom left here, you'll see obviously this looks like a nose stud and there's your earrings. Um, once again, if they are earring studs that are left up higher, they will generally stay up high and not cast an artifact across the image and ghost that. It's when the object is lower that it'll cast it up higher. So that object that's lower in the focal trough will project higher. And then the bottom right, probably one of the most popular um, uh, calls you may get when it comes to what is this thing in my pans and it looks like a St. Louis arch that's been filled, um, that's hopefully Everyone recognizes that as a uh, lead apron that's been left on uh, by the patient. So speaking of lead aprons, that's probably one of the biggest questions we get is, is it required to have a lead apron? I'm going to defer to your state. So whatever your state says is what you follow. For example, I'm in the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan law is, there is no law. And I think that's probably safe to say most states fall into that category. So what does no law mean? It means whatever the doctor prefers for their patient. The patient, or I'm sorry, the doctor of that practice is in charge of his patients. He gets to make or she gets to make the decision whether a lead apron is adequate. This study was done back in 2013. The manufacturers were talking a lot about lead aprons, whether they needed to be used. And so this study was published in 2013, which concluded that there was no statistical um, difference between a uh, radiograph uh, panoramic image taken with or without that lead apron. So um, this study here is, is a fantastic thing to have on file. Uh, to show that the radiation really truly isn't impacted by that lead apron. Now you'll say, wait a minute, lead aprons? I need to use lead aprons, don't I? Absolutely. Absolutely in the room. So radiation is higher inside the, uh, the room. Intro images are shot down on your patient, up on your patient to sensitive organs. And so the lead apron is required uh, by the ADA to have that on the patient. The only way that I know that you can get around not having a lead apron on a patient is if you were to possibly follow NCRP or ICRP, 
uh, NCRP's National Council of Radiation Protection, or ICRP. Um, those are the governing agencies of our industry. The ADA looks to them, uh, makes recommendations based upon the collaboration between these sort of organizations. And I believe when it comes to intraoral, the only way you're doing away with the lead apron possibly is to go long cone, le rectangle collimator, digital sensor, and then a uh, adjustable cavian MA in time um, intraoral x-ray on the wall. Other than that, you must be using a lead apron for your patients. So uh, speaking of lead aprons, um, if you're going to use a lead apron and you're going to have it um, um, uh, in the room or near the room, I would suggest that you um, hang it like you see on the left um, with a hanger, which is really nice, rather than draping it over the end of a chair or folding it um, to the point where it could damage the lead um, that's inside the the apron or the protective device that it's using if it's not lead. So hanging on a hanger is the ideal way to do it. I love these uh, poncho style uh, lead aprons. I like these because they're more well balanced. So the front and the back are even. Um, when you take those intraoral uh, types of, of lead aprons, um, they're usually built for reclining in the chair or, or slightly reclined, and they want to fall forward. And when you saw that image in the past there that you saw the lead apron, it's actually the lead apron from behind, not the front, just like your necklace. You'll notice you won't see the front of the necklace, you see the back of the necklace because of the way the radiation is, is transferring through the patient. So. The lead aprons that are intraoral are designed um, that are full front um, want to fall forward when you put them on a patient standing up. So I love this poncho style that you see in the middle here. It's much uh, well balanced for the patient. And if I could give you some advice, hike it up as high as you can in the front, low in the back as possible, because once again, if it falls forward because it is heavy, you will see that um, appear on the panoramic. But if you can hike it up as high as you can in the front, you shouldn't have any problems um, with a lead apron impeding uh, with, the, with the patient. Um, many have asked, you know, even up until I want to say a couple years ago, um, I've had many of that say, well, I was told to put the lead apron on the back of the patient, and you're saying put it on the front. Well, I think where that came from, the idea of the lead apron being on the back, I believe might have stemmed from experience with intraoral x-rays. And then when we transitioned over to panoramic technology, uh, unfortunately, some of those um, methods and theories may have been brought into panoramic technology. But I'll give you my opinion on it. The intraoral is placed on the front. The x-ray source is coming from the patient or to the patient from the front. That's why we're protecting the front of our patient. When we transitioned over to panoramic technology, one was thinking, well, let's put it on the back of the patient because the radiation is coming behind them and um, taking the image mostly from behind. So why wouldn't we put the lead apron on the back? Well, this is my argument regarding that, is that radiation is designed and penetrates right through the patient's head and goes right through to that sensor without a problem. In fact, if you had a meter reader and you had the state come in and look at your x-ray machine and they held it up to the machine, they probably will tell you, great news, no radiation anywhere because there's no one in the machine, right? So once that radiation passes through the patient, and goes to the sensor, we're probably fine. Once it hits something in their mouth, such as metal, it then scatters the radiation. Or if they had a necklace that was exposed and it hit that metal or earrings, it then scatters the radiation. So we would wanna protect the front of the patient because it's traveling through just fine. Once it hits the front here, hits metal in the mouth, it's going to naturally want to scatter which I would think is scattering more out here rather now than behind us. So uh, lead aprons, um, I would recommend always go on the front of your patient. Um, and then the last thing here, as far as preparing your patient, 
You've probably seen this before, leaving those earrings in there. If they're the loop earrings, the, the hanging earrings, we have to get those out. You see it casting over uh, the image, which is impeding the ability to diagnose properly. Uh, the studs up here, that's fine if they end up leaving those in there. You saw before they stay up in the image. Those objects lower are going to project across the image. So we want to do away with that. So let's go ahead and look at this one here. Any guesses out there? Let's see if our chat is working. Anybody looking at this image and seeing something strange and different? I'm going to give you a hint. We're still talking about preparation issues and errors. We're not talking about positioning. We're not talking about anything else. So if anybody on the chat wants to take a stab at this, I know they're probably scared to give the answer because then all their colleagues will see that they may have gotten the answer wrong. But Ooh, head tilted too low. That would be positioning. Hint, it has to do with preparing the patient. There it is. All right, so Deborah, not using a bite stick. That one is the answer. You will notice right there, the patient did not have the bite stick in their mouth. So all of their teeth are clenched and closed and overlapped. That's the issue. Preparing the patient, they did not put the bite stick in the machine. Very good, very good. So teeth together, no bite stick. All right, so let's move on to the really, really important uh, reason why we're here today is probably the positioning errors. What we can do as an industry to provide the best images possible from your panoramic machine. So once again, recap, three position lights, mid-sagittal right down between the eyes, Frankfurt plane, and you have what's called the layer light. Many might identify that better with what's called the canine light, because maybe your manufacturer said, place the light on the canine. Now those are all designed because we're dealing with a three-dimensional object in mid-sagittal designed to be centered between the patient's eyes, not tip and nose, between the patient's eyes, to make sure that we are centering our patient properly. When it comes to a, your Frankfurt plane, which is the light coming horizontally across the patient, which is going from the infant over margin here, coriander tragus, I'm sorry, to the infant over margin here. What happens is, is we set that so we're adjusting the tilt of the patient or the occlusal plane. And then the last position point is your layer light, or as I mentioned, what you might call the canine light. That's determining the AP position, the anterior posterior position of that focal trough. So once again, remember that focal trough is like a mouth guard. Where is it centered on our patient? Where is it tilted in the patient's mouth? And then where is it in space inside of our patient's mouth? That's why you have those three positioning points typically on a panoramic. So let's go ahead and take a test. If you have a sheet of paper and you have a pen or a pencil, write down one through 16. These are gonna be the sweet 16s, all right? So Number your paper from one to 16, and let's get started. Now, I'm gonna show you some images. We're gonna take a second to just jot it down just so we can have some fun, and we'll review these things as we go along, and I'm gonna probably ask for a shout out if anybody wants to take a stab at question number one. Any guesses besides a really bad pan? So anyone wanna type in what positioning issue happened with that staff member? when they position the patient. Once again, oh, twisted. All right, out of position, twisted, mid-sagittal off. Yes, 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 possibly, possibly. Uh, mid-sagittal plane not centered. Um, the big one is, is, is look at that. Look at how they are tilted sideways in there. So if you wrote down tilted, that is the answer to that one. The patient was in the machine, tilted into the machine. So mid-sagittal light, they had it centered, obviously that you cannot move, but they had the patient's head tilted into um, the wrong spot. So tilted was the answer to question number one. So let's move on to question number two. Any guesses on this one? This one might be a little tougher. Might not get many shout outs for this one. Everyone might want to keep this chin too low. I don't think the chin's too bad. 
tongue. Two forward, forward, forward. Okay, I want to draw your attention to something. When I give you the answer here, hopefully this will pop up here. Maybe, let's see if I get it right. You notice the spine on the one side? Bingo, who said not centered? <laughs> Jen Horwath, you're wonderful. Um, and then this side here is a lot thicker. I mean, you see a lot more of the spine. So they're not centered inside the machine. So it's very important that we make sure that that mid-sagittal light stays centered between their eyes and they're not shifted on the chin rest or on the bite stick. Because as you can see here, the spine is very small and this side is a lot larger. So I will tell you one of the biggest hints, actually I'll give you that in a second because I think it might be on this next one. Um, as far as um, what to really look for on a pan. All right, so this one here, this is uh, number three. So on your sheet of paper, go ahead and write your answer to number three. Just jot a little note. Uh, if you can't read your chicken scratch later, no big deal. I'll give you the answer here in a second. This one, let's see what we have here. Backward, okay. I don't know if they're saying backwards because they're looking at the image backwards. Left is on the right, right is on the left. Uh, some of the pans, I believe a lot of the military were doing pans where they flipped them the other way. Um, but now the standard for panoramic imaging is to be looking at your patient. I'm looking at my patient here. So the L is on the left side there. Head twisted, possible patient movement. Ooh, those are all good ones. All right, let's take a peek. Turned. So this patient was turned in the machine. So the mid-sagittal was correct, centered in the machine, but they were actually turned. So they maintained the center perfectly, but they turned a little bit. What's the downside to that? How did we know looking at that image? Look at the ramus here. Look at how wide that is. This side's much narrower. So you're looking at me in a picture frame and I turn my head this side's going to be wider. This side's going to be narrower. If I turn this way, the opposite. So this patient's right side is exposed larger than the left side. So I know which way they turned. So that's how we can read a pan. And you see this illustration here. I believe this came from uh, the Ohio State University. Um, these little illustrations are fantastic that they that they've uh, shared with the dental community of, of what those look like. But you can see the ramus bone is much wider on this side and narrower on this side, even though the mid-sagittal was centered perfectly. All right, so when it looks, we look at this image here, let's take a guess of what we think this one is. So this is number four. Any guesses on this? I would say this may be one of the most popular panoramic errors in dental. Apron collar pulled up too far. That's a good one, Kelly. Or I'm sorry, Naomi. Slouched. Oh, oh, Kelly, you got it. All right, so Kelly gets the star. It is radial opacity right through those darn anteriors, right in the symphysis area. We can't see anything. If we're trying to diagnose in that region, we better hope we got some good digital software so we can adjust our contrast and pull anything out. But when we have a patient that is what I called goosenecked, that's an issue. So you notice that the lines there that I, I showed on the screen here is the spine is at an angle. And what happens is, is we gooseneck the patient. So they're lunging forward into the machine. We wanna have them stand upright neutral so the radiation can pass through it. So if you look at goosenecking, this was a fantastic um, video from Little Style Shop um, that uh, shared this, this illustration here. But I want you to notice the spine here. When the patient lunges forward to that bite stick or you don't ask them to stand nice and tall, look at the depth of that spine from anterior to posterior, how deep that spine is. But if that patient were to stand up, now let's look at how narrow that is. So see the difference of those two? So if we look here, 
the first measurement, how wide it was and how narrow it is once they stood upright neutral position. I also equate it to a loaf of bread, right? So if you take a loaf of bread and um, it's a round loaf of bread and we get home on Friday night, we wanna make that bruschetta for our friends coming over after COVID, we slice it at an angle. What shape does that round object become? It becomes oblong. Now that the spine is at an angle, it's too thick. Once they go upright, it thins it out. So when that radiation can't pass through the object, it creates the term radiopacity. The radiation has a hard time passing through the object, hence the term radiopacity. So that's the answer to that one. So I know, oh, Kelly got the woohoo. Nice job, Kelly. All right, give her a raise, whoever her doctor is. All right, so any guesses of this one? We're on number five. We've got, um, looks like less than a half hour left. So we're gonna crank through these really quick. Um, this one's a really popular one. Those offices that are out there manually focusing, um, I'm sorry, but um, this is the stuff that you probably run into a lot. You get these large oversized anteriors, you get the big bugs, bunny teeth. We got tongue, shadow, patient too far forward, spinal shadow, a lot of stuff going on, Len. Um, yes, the main thing that you're seeing with that image is that radiopacity um, right through there, just like you saw in the other image, but look at how whitewashed that image is. Is there anything else missing on that image? Someone give me what's missing on that pan. There's a couple objects not on that pan as far as anatomy. Condyles, bingo. Spine, bingo. So that light was too far forward. So when you had that layer light that was setting the focal trough, you had the light too far forward. So now we have no spine. Teeth get larger, they're closer to the sensor. If you move that light back, I'm gonna give the answer to number six. If I move that light too far back, I have too much spine and my teeth get smaller. So the answer to number six, I'm giving it to you, is that light is too far back. So hopefully you saw the differences between those images. Too far forward, too far back, probably the two most popular panoramic positioning errors that happen. And that's because we're taking that canine light and we're putting it in the same spot every single time and it causes problems. All right, so we're on to number seven. This one's super easy. Everyone's getting this right. I'm not wasting anyone's time because if no one gets this right, we got to shut this whole thing down, right? So hello, which light are you referring to? All right, Eleanor, maybe your machine doesn't have it. Most machines have mid-sagittal. They have Frankfurt plane and they have what's called the layer light or the canine light. If your machine doesn't have it, you've got either one magic large focal trough or you have a machine that automatically focuses. It's one of the two. So if your machine is not a machine that automatically can focus and it doesn't have a layer light, safe to say it's got one large focal trough. Purpose of that is, is a lot of people can go feed on that machine in that focal trough, right? So there's a big focal trough. You can fit a lot of information in there, just might not have nice, sharp, crisp images. So manufacturers put a canine light on there because they want to thin out that focal trough to get sharper images, especially on the interiors. So if you don't have a canine light, that might be why. Otherwise, you have a machine that automatically focuses. This one's too easy, chin too low, boom. All right, so we got the patient's chin too low. Ronald McDonald smile going on. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. Another easy one, simple. Number eight, please write down on your piece of paper, the chin was too high. So now we have the patient's chin too high, obviously distorting the image. The upper anteriors are all shortened. The lowers are all um, uh, elongated and we just have a really distorted image. You can see the pallet of bone is just blocking everything here and just becomes a problem. So the answer to number eight is chin too high. All right, so then that leads us to number nine. If you're following my pattern, you know the answer to this one. Let's see if anyone wants to type the answer. Don't be scared. Tongue shadow, lip shadow. Absolutely. That's one of the things there. I want you to think about positioning. 
I want you to think about the patient and what they're doing. I want you to think about what you did as an operator positioning that patient. Not lips. Don't you hate it when I tell you you're wrong, Kelly? You got that one right, so you did well. Movement. All right, let's move on. Number nine, the answer is flat occlusion. Flat occlusion. So you had the patient in there too flat. Remember, we want it tipped down right about five or 10 degrees. If we go too low, bad. Too high, bad. Flat, bad too. Why is it bad? That palda bone is blocking the root tips of all those uppers. We can't see anything on that pan. We're looking for any sort of uh, lesion of endodontic origin, we're, we're toast, right? We're taking another pan. It's no different than your spine. Remember the spines like this, radiation passes through it, go like this, thicken it up, can't pass through it. Palda bone's no different. If I tip it down, I thin it out. Radiation can pass through it. If I flip it straight up, look how thick it's gonna be. Radiation can't pass through it. So the answer to that one is flat occlusion. All right, this one has two. So this is questions 10 and 11. You got two panoramic errors. So I'm gonna give you a hint, there's two of them here. This one we're gonna take a little bit to write those down. And if anybody wants to participate, no bite stick. Whoa, 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 Nita, you got it, nailed it. First try. So there's no bite stick, we're missing anteriors, right? So uh, the anti upper anteriors are missing. So the operator, the technician brought them into the machine. Maybe they used the bite stick. It's hard for me to see if they even used it. Maybe they did, but they're clenching down because there's nothing stopping those uppers. So what I would recommend you do, get those cotton rolls and put those right on, on the occlusal uh, plane. Just put them on the occlusal surface of all those molars there and you will literally open up that bite perfectly. Don't put the cotton roll on the anteriors. You put that cotton roll on the anteriors for this patient, they're gonna still squish and clench right through that cotton roll and they're gonna still clench. That's why we always put them back here on the molars. And then I saw somebody say spine too big. Yun Huang, perfect answer. Look at all that spine. The spine tells you the answer to 90% of your problems. So if we are looking at a pan, I want you to go and look at the spine first. Start your story with the spine. That's going to tell you a lot about what happened here. So Yoon looked at this image and said, wow, lots of spine. Immediately knew the light was too far back. Knew that the result was going to be really small anteriors. Not too bad here, but look how everything's getting smaller. And then the other person got it right with the um, no bite stick. So that one, it was a two for one, light too far back teeth together. And then let's move on to, I think that takes care of all of the positioning concerns. Now we're going to move on to the patient errors. So the last category is patient errors. These are most technicians favorite ones because you can blame somebody else, right? The patient didn't listen, doc. So this is why we had the problem. So here's what I'd recommend you do is take control. Simple as that. You're in charge. You're an x-ray technician. You are certified to be taking x-rays of a very important medical device. You're in charge. If you've ever been to the hospital, I will tell you right now, if you're on this uh, webinar and you used to work as an x-ray technician in the hospitals, it's completely different in dental. We're very gentle. We're a little caring. We don't want to grab the patient, take control. In a medical environment, they need to get a diagnostic image as fast as they can, and they need to get it to the radiologist or to the doctor as fast as they can. So patient comfort sometimes goes out the window. And I'm not saying be rough with the patient, but be in charge, repeat things to them, make sure they understand, try things before you get into the machine. I'll give you some tips and tricks on that when we're done here. But when we look at this image here, what did the patient do? Someone said this earlier. I'm going to give you a hint. Someone said this earlier. I mentioned it and I said, ooh, tongue not on the roof of mouth. 
someone scrolls back up. I think, let me scroll back up there and see who got that. Motion, there you go. It was Masada, I knew you said that. All right, so motion. So what they noticed is, is look at those lower anteriors, right? So first thing they want, looked at the spine. Spine looked good, everything looked seemed nice and balanced. Um, look at those lower anteriors. They're out of focus, they seem to be sweeped. Maybe they are shaped like that, but they seem to be strange and different. If I was to guess what happened on that image, if I was to guess, <clears throat> what happened was is the patient didn't move because they, the tube had brushed them. I don't think they moved because they wanted to. I think they moved because their lowers were not in that bite stick. Take a look at that. Look at that bite stick. Look at the space. It's almost like they're hovering out of that bite stick. They probably didn't fall into the grooves and they were set back a little bit on that bite stick. So those lowers are away from the focal trough and they're blurred, but then they're kind of swooped. So I'm guessing when that tube had one around and when it was behind them, they moved their jaw just at the right time and the image caught it. Because if you look, as I point to the screen and you can't see what I'm pointing to, look at the, the, those molars, they're in focus. They're in focus, the anteriors go out of focus. But look at the uppers, I see PDLs. So the uppers are in focus, they're sitting in the bite stick groove, they're not moving, the lower's moved. So you got it, lips tightly shut. All right, so you got that right. Give yourself an extra credit point for that movement one, uh, whoever answered that one. 13 and 14, this one's kind of easy. There's two errors. So write down 13 and 14, what you think those two errors are. I'll give you a second. Open mouth, you got it, Barbara. So Barbara, absolutely perfect answer. They have a completely open mouth and then they're seeing a tongue shadow. Yeah, I kind of see that a little bit there. Um, I will tell you the good news, you know, sometimes you see that. Um, this soft, if they, their software, they can probably make some adjustments because I can see pretty well in those areas and I could use my software to clean that up. But the big thing that I wanted to catch, look at flat occlusion. All right, you guys are doing really good. The two big panoramic errors there, there's probably several, but the big ones I wanted you to catch was that open mouth. You can see that going on um, right there. So the patient did not have their, um, their lips around the bite stick and their teeth were not in the groove. So they were open bite, but then they also had their lips open because you can see the radiation blasting through. Now, if their teeth were in the bite stick and they left their mouth open, guess what you would have caused? Radiation burnout. You can even see it right here on the size ledge of those centrals. The radiation's blasting through there so fast and getting to that sensor that it doesn't have anything to slow it down and it burns out the x-ray. Does that make sense? So hopefully you got the answers to 13 and 14 because we are moving on to, if I can get my computer to move. All right, this one's super easy. Many of you said this over and over and over. So you will get number 15 right because you've said it before. Say it again. Can I get a shout out for what the problem is here? It's probably tied for the most popular issue. Flat occlusion, tongue shadow. The tongue is not on the roof of the mouth. The full tongue is not on the roof of the mouth. So I got, call that little dark mustache there, right? So I'm gonna tell you as far as a tip and trick, I'm gonna give you several. One of the big ones I'll share with you is make sure you say full tongue to the roof of your mouth. Often if I hear technicians in front of that machine and I walk by or I'm standing by, I often hear the operator say, put your tongue to the roof of your mouth. And that to me could be the problem. Because if you're doing it right now, which I know some of you right now are, you're putting the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth and your oral pharynx is still open. So I want you to get that full tongue to the roof of your mouth. I've heard an, an office today, she said, what about suctioning my tongue to the roof of the mouth or tell them to swallow one last time. You can say whatever you need to do to accomplish the full tongue getting to the roof of the mouth 
and staying there as long as it can because it needs to serve as a backdrop for those apices. We need to slow down the radiation because if that oral pharynx is open, that radiation is going to blast right through that. And I have a question of will this be a recording be available? Absolutely. If you go to planmecca.com, all of our video or our uh, lecture series are available. You won't get the one CE, unfortunately, um, but you can watch this. You can review it. If you're a good friend of Plan Mecca in the family, contact your Plan Mecca rep. They have all of these panoramic errors that are in the industry today. And it tells you what the image is. It tells you what caused it and how to fix it. So your Plan Mecca rep can certainly share that with you and, 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 and glad to provide that for you. All right, so we're gonna move on to the very last one. Um, hey, let me go back here a second. If you've got kids and you're taking pans of children, a lot of times they have a hard time understanding things like lips around the bite stick, full tongue, roof of mouth, breathe through your nose, right? So you just gave them those instructions that might be hard to understand because it was said very fast. Maybe what you should say to children, something that they may understand is sucking out like a milkshake or a straw, right? So if I suck on it like a milkshake and I know someone's doing that right now, they're pretending they're sucking on a milkshake. What they're doing is, is the lips are going around the, the straw their full tongue's going to the roof of their mouth and they're breathing through your nose. And if you think I'm wrong on this one, I'll prove you wrong. When you go to McDonald's next and get a shake, you're going to be thinking about how to take a pan, right? I guarantee it. Next time you take a sip of a shake, you're going to think about this training session that we went through today. All right. So the very last one, we're going to close out the night with number 16 on your sheet of paper. This one's for extra credit. I know I've got several board certified radiologists that are joining us tonight because they want to see what this is all about. And I know they're going to get it right. I know I've got some assistants out there that I've trained before and some hygienists. I'm going to give you a hint. Len, you're on to it. Keep going. It's not just tongue shadow. I'm not giving any more hints. Not going to give any more. It literally is the patient swallowed. So what happened is, is the tongue moved during the, the image and during that acquisition, it caught it. So you saw the patient swallow right there during the image acquisition. That's why I think some will say, put your tongue to roof your mouth and, and keep it there so that they don't swallow or swallow one last time before the image is taken. So we are finished up with that. And I just want to share with you some tips of how do I do it? So tomorrow when you have your, your, you're in front of your machine, if I can give you some tips and tricks to walk away with, obviously mid-sagittal, let's start with that, right? Mid-sagittal, you want it between the eyes, right in the nasion, centered between their eyes, not the tip of the nose. Occlusal plane, you want to tip it down about five to 10 degrees, okay? So you want that tip down ever so slightly. If you've got Frankfurt plane and you want to use that, Coriander tragus, lined up the info over the margin right here, get those two points set up. That'll get your occlusal plane pretty close to where you need it to be. If you got one of those facing machines and you're looking at your patient, just have them smile big and tip them down so you see that occlusal uh, uh, table. And then the last thing is, is that light on the side. If your machine has one, put that light wherever your manufacturer told you to set it, um, typically near the canine. If yours automatically focuses, yay, press the button, let the machine figure it out, which is really cool. Um, and, and, and that's some of the tips I would say. Your broad-shouldered patients, tell them to relax, get them to drop their shoulders. Um, make sure that once you're ready to acquire the image, um, that you tell them to put their lips around the bite stick, the full tongue to the roof of their mouth, and breathe through the nose and then acquire the image. When you're all done, let them out and hopefully you'll have a great image. So hopefully that um, kind of walks you through the methodology of taking a good pan. And um, I wanna leave you guys with this. Let's go ahead and grade it, okay? So if you've ever seen any of my lecture series, uh, I told you I'm from Michigan. If you've ever been up to God's country up in Northern Michigan, <clears throat> I did a, a lecture recently for the, um, 
high, uh, dental assistant uh, organization up there in Northern Michigan, actually two of them up there recently. And we had some fun and we did a thing which um, was called Dentistry Needs More Ninjas, okay? And so this is from a really good friend of mine Angela Severance, who creates ninjas out there. So dental assistants, and that ninja stands for no, I'm not just any assistant. But I know we don't have just assistants here. So we're gonna change it tonight, and we're gonna change ninja to represent, let's see here, no, I'm not just another specialist. So we all need ninjas. Hopefully you guys took this test. Let's grade it, see how you did, add them up. So if you don't know anything about being a ninja, there's different classifications of ninjas. I didn't even know this, but now I do because I'm a ninja. <clears throat> so if you got 10 of those correct, you are a ninja, you earn ninja status, okay? If you got 12 of them correct, they call that a genin ninja. So you're elevated to a genin ninja. If you got 13 of them correct, we're going to make you a Chunin Ninja, and you are at a higher level. You are almost at the elite of x-ray technicians out there, and if you're a dentist and you got 13 of those right, kudos to you. You're a Chunin Ninja, and if you got 14 right, I'm guessing you're a board-certified radiologist on the line here, and we're going to call you the Jonin Ninjas. So Jonin Ninjas are way up there at the top of the food chain of ninjas. They got 14 correct, and if you got all 16 correct, you are a special ninja. You got none wrong. You're probably Dr. Bob Langley watching this right now, and you nailed every single one of these, or you're a really good um, uh, manufacturer rep that does a lot of training. You're a clinical trainer as well, and you got all 16 right. You are what's called a cage ninja. I didn't even know this. So the cage ninja is the top of the food chain. They are the head of the village, the head of the community of the ninjas. And that's what you are for being here today. So I appreciate everybody for being here um, with us today. I want to say Kitos, which is thank you in Finnish, which is where our company is from. And we are, we are done with this lecture. What I'm going to do now, if you don't mind, is I'm going to check out any sort of questions that we have as we round this out. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, <clears throat> at the bottom here, um, I'm gonna post this link for the CE right now. Um, but before I do that, you can see it on the bottom of the screen. If you take a, your phone and wanna take a picture of that, go for it. I'm gonna hit escape here if you don't mind. Let's see if I can not mess this up for you guys. All right, come on. We don't want that. All right, escape, end show. All right, let me get you that link. And I'm gonna post it, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're gonna post it if I can find out where I just lost my chat. All right, where did my little chat go? All right, give me one second. We got Q&A there, we've got participants, all right. Click over here, attendees. All right. Now, if I could figure out what just happened to my lovely screen, I might be able to figure out how I'm going to get you that link. All right. Let's go to Q&A. We've got that. And I want to get my chat going. There you went. You hit on me. All right. So I'm going to go to chat. <clears throat> I'm going to right click. I'm going to paste it. There is the link. You can click on that. And it's a digital link taking you right where you need to be. If it asks for a code, you need to type in code 730. That is the code. So let me type that in for you. 730 is the code. So hopefully you all see that there. Please visit us at our uh, website at planmecca.com. Um, to, to see more of these. If you're asking about a recording, um, yes, it is um, being recorded and will be sent to you um, if you registered. Um, let me just check out, make sure there's no more questions. What is the light device you are using as a pointer on the screen? Okay, give me a shout later on. You know how to find me at Plan Mecca's website. 
um, you should be able to figure, uh, get in touch with me. I can share with you what that was. Please repeat the full tongue to the roof of the mouth one more time. All right. Let's see here. Any tips for elderly hunched patients who cannot uh, straighten? All right. So let's go. Live answer here. So elderly patients that are hunched over, um, if they're older, they may have a very difficult time even raising their chin up there. Do the best you can. Obviously, keep them comfortable and do the best you can. Don't beat yourself up. Um, but if they do have um, the, the, uh, a neck that's larger, let's say, a lot of muscle and all that, typically I'll tell them to relax and drop their shoulders. That's a good thing to do. Maybe get one flat foot forward that pushes um, their foot forward and drops their shoulders. Uh, someone mentioned sit on a chair. Sitting on a chair is actually a great technique um, that's used for older patients. Um, I have uh, experience with, um, with uh, let's say a 3D image where we want to make sure it's perfect. And when they get in that, that chair like that and they're older, they tend to want to sit up more upright because the chair is supporting them. So that's All right, so I think we are all set. We answered all of the questions. We appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. And uh, we will see you out on the circuit for the next lecture series. We appreciate it. You have a wonderful night.